All right, let's get started. The operating system, the hardware and software are logically equivalent, but only if both hardware and software are error free. And it's been a very long time since I've seen error free software. That just sort of does not happen. Um, if I'm going to have a multi-programming system that is robust, that is, that works reliably, remember multi-programming is running more than one program at a time, that, that robust multi-programming system needs three things from the hardware. And I guarantee this is on the final exam, okay? Y'all didn't believe me when I told you the program counter would be on the exam. It's going to be on the final exam, too. The operating system needs, from the hardware, it needs privileged instructions. And remember, privileged instructions are those that can only be used by the operating system. There's a mode bit that lets the hardware know whether the operating system or an application is running, and the privileged instructions fail with an illegal instruction interrupt if you try to use them in an application program. It needs protected memory, and we'll talk about why protected memory is necessary and how we can do protected memory. And it needs a timer that can generate interrupts. We'll talk about that timer on Thursday. We're not going to get to that one today. If we are going to do multi-programming, more than one program running at the same time, the operating system has to allocate memory to processes. So I've got this memory is just a collection of bytes, and it's the operating system that has to make sense of that and deal, and deal with uh, allocating memory to the applications. So I went by that a little bit too fast. Here's the problem. If a malicious or erroneous program, and there's plenty of both kinds out there, uh, plenty of programming errors and also plenty of malicious programs could read or write any part of memory. Then they can read or write memory belonging to other programs or to the operating system. So we need to keep one program from writing all over the memory of another program, including from writing all over the memory of the operating system. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Now, the, I guess the second law of information technology is it's not that simple. The first law is everything takes longer and costs more. That will not be on the exam. And the third law is you have to know the plural of fiasco. Okay, the, the it's not that simple piece. Sometimes programs need to read or write areas of memory belonging to the operating system. Um, particularly if the operating system reads from a disk into a buffer in memory and the OS o owns that memory, then the application program that ask, asked for the disk read needs to be able to read it, okay? Memory con protection schemes, and we'll talk about several of them, control this stuff. Some IBM operating systems assigned a code to processes and the same code to blocks of memory and a process could only read or write memory that had a code matching that code of the process. Now, back when I was messing with IBM operating systems, in the days when you had to get up early and shovel coal into the computer, um, that was a 4-bit code, which meant you could only have 16 processes, right? I'm pretty sure the operating system got code zero, so you could really only have 15 applications. These days, you'd need a bigger code. There are hundreds of processes running in Windows 10 or 11. Another mechanism is to assign two registers, a base register. This is the lowest memory address that an application has allocated to it, and a limit register, which is the highest memory address. Now we've got two registers that mark off a block of memory, and we say processes can only access memory between those two addresses, or actually within them, because they're inclusive. Virtual memory, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, provides a completely different solution. All the things I've been talking about so far involve assigning 
um, an area of memory to a process and then making sure the process deals only with its, that, its own assigned area of memory. If, you, if I partition memory in fixed partitions, and early operating systems used to do this. They would take all our memory and divide it into some number of slices. If you didn't have a big enough free partition, a program couldn't run. You had to have a partition big enough for the program you were trying to run. You can also do variable partitioning, but that leads to memory fragmentation. And there's a picture coming up to explain memory fragmentation. There it is. We start with the operating system loaded in low memory. We load Microsoft Word, and then we load JGrasp or something else to do our programming homework, and we close Word. Now there's a hole in memory. The free memory is fragmented. There is unassigned memory above the OS and before JGrasp. So if we do first fit, with a new program, that's fastest because the operating system looks for the first area of memory where this new program will fit. And that works, it's fast, but the remaining area might be unusably small. Now there's a little chunk of memory above new program and below JGrasp that's probably too small to do anything with. Best fit almost always leaves small holes. You might get lucky and exactly find a hole that is precisely the size you need, but most of the time best fit leaves small holes. Biggest fit probably leaves a space large enough to be useful. So that third diagram on the slide, there are now free areas of mem memory, each of which is potentially big enough to do something with. Memory can be fragmented either internally or externally. In internal fragmentation, that's the left diagram, um, JGrasp has asked for more memory than it needs. So it, uh, it's assigned, but it's not being used. External fragmentation is that little hole between new program and JGrasp on the right-hand diagram. Now, all of that's going to go away when we do virtual memory, and modern operating systems almost all do do virtual memory, with the exception of things like camera operating systems. Operating systems for the so-called Internet of Things may not do virtual memory. So we have this problem that programs are compiled and linked to specific starting addresses. Remember, the linkage editor pulls all the stuff in from the library and Shift, shifts everything around and adjusts addresses. Often that starting address is zero, and so the addresses in the program have to be relocated, have to be adjusted to match this, the location where the program is actually loaded. That is part of memory management, and as you can see from the diagram, it says new program must load here, but that address is not predictable when the program is compiled and linked. We don't have any clue where it will be loaded, okay? Now, that is the thing that people dealt with mostly in the dark ages, but now still with things like camera or phone operating systems. When I first started programming, we had very small memories, 32K bytes, and we wanted to do big stuff. And we did the big stuff with this thing called an overlay. Programs get divided into small logical pieces and under programmer control, that is the programmer who's writing the application, has to plan this and make it work. Under pro programmer control, those pieces get loaded into memory. That was messy and error prone. But here's why, if I have an assembler program, that a two-pass assembler, that reads through all of the source code and builds a symbol table, then reads through it again to generate object code. Well, it might be bigger than the memory that I have, but I don't need the pass two code while pass one is running, okay? If I could run pass one and then overlay 
the pass one code with the pass two code, I save a hunk of memory and maybe I can make my program fit. Now, nobody does this anymore, but I'm telling you about it for a reason. And the reason is that some folks at the University of Manchester decided they could automate the overlay process. If I have logical pages, we'll talk about the size of a page in a minute, but if you want to put a number on it right now, you can think about 4K bytes, okay, 4,096 bytes. As you can see, the pass one code kind of lands in the middle of a page there. That red line says I'm, I am between those two page boundaries. That's the logical memory. In physical memory, we divide physical memory into page frames, which are the same size as pages. And now the operating system is going to manage bringing logical pages into physical page frames as they are needed. And that whole thing is, is how we get virtual memory, which all modern operating systems, all modern general purpose operating systems use. So here is a memory map of my laptop. It has a 64-bit address space, 16 exabytes, but it's only got 16 gigabytes, also called gigabytes. Um, they're different, right? The gigabytes are the ones that are powers of two. That's in chapter one, which was a long time ago. I've got a 16-bit address space, but I've only got 16G of installed memory. The address space is addressable. All right, I can generate addresses in that 64 bits, but it's not useful because there's no memory installed there. Does that make sense? I can only use the memory that's physically there. And I don't think anybody has a computer with 16 exabytes of memory, unless maybe it's the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland. They do a bunch of secret stuff in that basement at Fort Meade. Okay, virtual memory increases the apparent amount of memory the memory that the programmer can see by using disk space, which is much less expensive. Even if I'm using a solid state drive, it's still much less expensive than real memory. And I get almost for free, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but I get almost for free lunch uh, for free process separation. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Virtual memory works through this mechanism called demand paging. Pages, logical program pages, are brought into physical memory page frames as they are needed. There is a page table that's part of the operating system's data that keeps track of what is in memory and what is out on disk. Now, two important principles, and I guarantee that this one is on the exam. Temporal locality of reference says that if a page has been used re recently, it is likely to be used again soon. And if you think about writing programs, um, you write a short loop, right? And if that loop crosses two pages, this one, which has been used recently, is going to be used again in the next iteration of that loop. Compilers collect all the data together. So if a page containing data has been used recently, it is likely to be used again soon. Now, likely is the best you can get. Is it possible to defeat locality of reference? Sure. But in ordinary circumstance, a programmer need not worry about putting locality of reference into the programmer's program. It's part of the, the nature of things in the von Neumann architecture. Okay, there's also spatial locality of reference. If an area of memory is accessed, likely nearby areas will be accessed soon maybe even that same area. Once again, think about your loop or think about ex 
accessing data. So two kinds of locality of reference, temporal, that means time, and spatial. Okay, most memory references are confined to small regions at any given instant. Your program might wander all over memory as it runs for minutes at a time, but at any given instant it's likely to be referring to small regions of memory. That's why caches work. Well-written programs have small loops, small procedures, small functions. Data is likely in an array or the compiler stores the variables together. Now, listen up. The definition of working set in the Microsoft website is wrong. Let me say that again. The definition on the Microsoft website is wrong. If you give me that definition, it'll be wrong. Okay? This definition, the working set of a program is the number of pages sufficient to run it normally. That is, um, actually that should say page frames, but that's okay. Um, the number of page frames of memory sufficient to run the program normally. That is to satisfy the locality of that particular program at that particular moment. And I'm not even going to tell you what the Microsoft definition is because it'll stick in your mind and get you. Okay? Just, just stay away from those Microsoft web pages when you're talking about virtual memory. The working set, to, be, to put it more simply, is the amount of real memory a program needs to run more or less normally. And we'll talk about what more or less normally means as we go on. Thrashing is the opposite of more or less normally. I don't have enough physical memory, so the operating system is spending all of its time juggling pages and page frames back and forth between disk and memory, and no real work is getting done. Does that make sense? If I don't have enough real memory, and I'm running, say, 17 programs, right? If I don't have enough real memory for all 17 programs, I, the operating system spends its time moving data around between disk and memory instead of spending its time getting work done. Or I have one really huge program and I'm trying to do something weird that does not exhibit locality of reference. If you want to confuse a virtual memory operating system, define an array row-wise and then access it column-wise. You'll break things. Um, actually, what you'll do is cause, cause thrashing. Okay. Yes? So when you're referring to pages, do you refer to them as just a number or as the amount of space they take up in memory. Okay, I think I said, but I might, it might have been before you came in, um, we'll talk about memory, and for the time being, let's talk about 4K bytes for pages. Okay, so when I'm talking about pages in memory, would I say just the amount of pages there are, or the amount in general that you just said? The number of, we're going to talk about pages as parts of programs and page frames as real memory, physically installed memory. Okay, so I can say that if I have 32K of real memory, that is eight page frames. I'm using small numbers so I can do the arithmetic in my head, right? But if you have 16 gigabytes of real memory, you can divide whatever that exponent is, and I don't remember it right now, by 12, which is 4K is to the 12th, and that's how many page frames you have. How many pages you have depends on the size of your program. A little bitty program might only need five or six pages. We, we really did used to write programs that would run in 32K. A uh, great big honking program might need hundreds of pages. Okay? Okay. 
Virtual memory is transparent. Brown's definition of transparent is it's there, you but you can't see it. My definition of virtual is you can see it, but it's not there. Okay, so virtual memory is transparent. It's there, but the programmer can't see it. That's all managed by the operating system and the hardware. The entire program and all of the data that the program is going to use is stored on disk. That could be a magnetic spinning hard disk or it could be a solid state drive. Doesn't make any difference. Pieces of the program and its data, those are pages, get read into page frames in main memory as they are needed. And we'll talk about how that works in a second. That's called demand to paging. Paging takes time. Even with solid state drives, there is a time penalty to be paid for paging. I told you we got memory protection almost free. Here's the almost. Okay. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There are headings on the left column as well as on the top here. In the, we talk about the program being divided into pages and the addresses in the program being logical addresses. The pages are 2K or 4K, 2 kibibytes or 4 kibibytes or more. And how many of them can be in a program? That depends on the number of address bits in the effective address. Remember, the effective address is the one that's used to actually add memory. I mean, access memory after all the address arithmetic is done. Physical memory page frames, and they have to be the same size as pages. They are, they are addressed with physical address in real memory. Um, they are the same size as logical pages. And how many, how many page frames depends on the amount of installed real memory. Okay, virtual addresses have two parts, a page number, a page number and an offset. So if I have a 32-bit address, and I'm, we'll talk about 64-bit computers in a, in a second, but this is a lot easier to, you, to deal with if I use 32 bits for the examples. If I've got a 32-bit address and 4K pages, the 12-bit offset is enough to address anywhere in that 4K page, right? So I take away from 32 bits 12 bits of offset, and I have 20 bits of page number. To the 20th is about a million, so I'm going to have a, a, approximately a million virtual pages available for this program. As far as getting to the memory management unit, that's a 32-bit flat address. The parts get broken up by the memory management unit to find the real physical address in real memory. And there's a diagram coming up to show you how that works. Okay, here is a mapping of 16 virtual pages to eight page frames in real memory. Okay, I have something called a page table. If I were using 32-bit addresses and 4K pages, that page table would have a million entries to the 20th entry. The virtual pages are all numbered starting at zero. That number doesn't occupy a place in the table. But then there's a valid bit, and the job of the valid bit is to tell whether that virtual page is already in memory in a physical page. And then the, the thing that's labeled page table, I'm going to need to fix that. Looking at the top row, Virtual page 15 is in physical page 7. Looking at virtual page 10 in the middle of the table. Virtual page 10 is in physical page frame. I should have said page frame a minute ago. It's in physical page frame 0. Looking down at the bottom, virtual page 0 has a zero valid bit. It is not in memory anywhere. Page 15 is in page frame 7. Page 14 is in page frame 6. Page 13 is in page frame 3. They don't have to be contiguous or in order. 
virtual page 10 is in physical page frame 0. And similarly, you can do that with all the rest of them. Okay? The page table provides a mapping from those logical pages that the programmer deals with to the physical page frames in real main memory. Okay, here is how the translation works. And I'm going to make a 30-bit main memory address. So I have 2 to the 30th, which is, what, about a billion? Yes, 2 to the 30th, about a billion bytes of main memory. But I've got a 32-bit virtual address. We divide that virtual address into offset and page. And if we're using 4K pages, there's 12 bits of offset. The 20-bit virtual page is a pointer into the page table. And it turns out there's a whole, uh, there's 18 zeros and two ones, a binary three in there. So the memory management unit looks at that binary three, goes to the page table entry three, finds a one in the valid bit, and it finds a six, four plus two, in the page table entry. And so that virtual address is in page frame six. And then we use the remaining 12 bits as an offset to find out where in that page frame that address points to. Somebody explained this to Grace Hopper sometime in the 1980s. And she said, we had that in 1950. We called it tape. Uh, this is not the same thing. So 4, 4K pages. So the address within the page is 12 bits. Um, that's the offset piece. The remainder, what's left, 32 minus 12, 20, that's the page number. And the page frame gets looked up in the page table using that virtual page number. Um, we're going to get there. Um, but just to not mystify you, when a, page when a page must be evicted from a page frame, we need to know whether it's been changed. And we'll talk about that in some detail in a minute. How are we doing? We're doing okay. We're going to finish on time, even with a late start. We look up the physical page frame number in the page table and then just copy the offset. And all of that happens in the memory management unit. When a reference is made to a page that's not in memory, that is not in a page frame, that's called a page fault. A page fault is not an error. Let me say it again. A page fault is not an error. Page faults happen all the time in a virtual memory system. A page fault, the memory management unit looks in the, in the page table, finds a zero in the valid bit, throws up its hands and says, that page is not in a physical page frame, and the memory management unit generates an interrupt. The interrupt causes the operating system to run and load that page from disk into a page frame in memory. And then the operating system restarts the instruction that caused the page fault. When we had that interrupt, we saved the program counter. Now the program counter points to the next instruction, but we also saved enough information to restart that instruction. Okay, so when a page that is not in main memory is accessed, it causes a page fault, and it's the job of the operating system to copy that page from disk, which could either be magnetic disk or SSD, into real memory, into a page frame. In handling a page fault, the first step is to check to see if the page is in memory at all. And if it is, the memory management unit can just keep going. If the valid bit is a zero, the memory management unit generates an interrupt. The operating system runs. 
finds the needed page on the disk, if it can find an empty page frame, it uses it. But if it can't find an empty page frame, then a page has to be evicted from main memory. Okay? If I filled up all of, all of physical memory and I need another one, I need another page frame, I'm going to have to evict one that's already there. Then the page from disk gets loaded into that page frame, the page table gets updated, and the instruction that caused the page fault is restarted. Page fault, page not in memory. The OS might have to evict a page from memory, and there are several algorithms that might be used to pick who to evict. First in, first out turns out to be just a terrible algorithm. Back in 1969, a computer scientist named Bellady determined that increasing the number of page frames results in more page faults if you're using first in, first out. Okay, least recently used, that turns out to be not as good as we might like either. Least frequently used turns out to be the winner, but of course there's some bookkeeping to to keep track of how frequently a page is used. And remember, this stuff only happens in a page fault, and a page fault is going to result in a disk read, it might result in a disk write as well, and the CPU is about a million times faster than that magnetic disk. So I can do a lot of bookkeeping if it will save me from some disk reads and writes. Okay, there's a trade-off there. Now, here's a problem with least recently used. I've got pages 0 through 7 in there. The next page I need is page 8. Well, guess what? Page 0 was least recently used. So it gets evicted and page 8, get virtual page 8, gets loaded. But now I need virtual page 0 again. Now page 1 is going to be evicted. And then I'm going to need that in D. And I'm going to need the next one in E, and so on. I am moving pages back and forth unnecessarily. So we probably do something like least frequently used. Yes? This is going to cause thrashing. It's not the only thing that causes thrashing. And the usual thing that causes thrashing is trying to run more programs than you have physical memory for at that instant. That is why adding memory to a computer is probably the simplest thing you can do to improve performance. Okay, here it is. The dirty bit. If a page that's going to be evicted and replaced has not been changed, I can just throw it away. I can write over it because I've got a copy of it on the disk. It got there by being loaded from disk. If it has not been changed since it was loaded from disk, I've still got a copy of it, right? Okay, however, if it has been changed, it's got to be written out to disk before we can bring that next page in. So there's a, a disk write operation by the operating system there. It is not required that a virtual memory system implement that dirty bit, but the other choice is to write every page out when you evict it. The dirty bit gets set to zero when the page is first loaded, and at that point, the page in the page frame in real memory and the logical page on disk are identical because we just read it from disk into memory. Every time the page is modified, we set that dirty bit to 1. And that's going to seem wasteful to you when I say every time, but guess what? It's faster just to set it every time there's a write than it is to look and see if it needs to be set. Now, everything we've looked at so far was just one logical program and one physical memory. There's only one physical memory but there are usually many programs running, hundreds of them in Windows. Every process has its own page table. And it's up to the memory management unit to be sure 
that the physical pages and the logical pages stay consistent. Part of that is only the operating system is allowed to update the page tables. All right, so I've been sort of provisionally using 4096 bytes, 4 kibibytes, 2 to the 12th, as a page size. About half of the last page is unused, so there's some wastage there, because it's unlikely that a program is going to be an exact multiple of 4K, right? All right, however, the page table has to be in memory. And if I have small pages, I have a big page table because I got a lot of entries. No such thing as a free lunch. Larger pages can also use I.O. more effectively. Page table smaller, I.O. more efficient. Four kibibytes is common because it matches the block size of modern disks. Modern disks tend to have four kibibyte blocks. They used to have 512 byte blocks back when you had to get up early and shovel coal into the computer. I never worked with a computer that needed coal, but I did work with one that had a mercury delay line memory that took about an hour to warm up before you could use the computer. The delay line memory sends pulses into a tank of mercury and retrieves them at the other end and the time it takes for a pulse to travel from the pulse generator to the receiver is the speed of sound in that tank of mercury. It has to be at a known temperature because the temperature affects the speed of sound. Things are simpler now, believe it or not. 64 kibibyte pages and even gibibyte huge pages might be in our future. Big pages mean smaller page tables, but they also mean more disk I.O. If I'm going to, yes? Wouldn't that also mean that you need more offset bits for the addresses? Um, the question was, do, does a big page mean I need more offset bits? Yes. I need enough offset bits to index any, any location in that page. So wouldn't that be a trade-off that we have to um, there's not, that isn't really a trade-off because that division between the page table number and the offset is a sort of an artifact of how the memory management unit works. It's, it's how many pages do I need to grab for the page table number. I mean, how many bits do I need to grab for the page table number and the rest of them are offset bits. So it's not, it's not quite as big a deal as you might think. Okay. For 64-bit addresses and 4 kibibyte pages, I need a million entry page table. Now, if we've got, you know, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bytes, that's 8 megabytes for the page table. That is not very much in modern computers. But every process needs its own page table, and now it starts getting big. With 64-bit addresses, the page table would need 2 to the 52 power of entries, four and a half quadrillion entries. There is no room in memory for a page table that size. And so we do multi-level page tables. For a single level page table, that's 20 bits of page table entry number and 12 bits of offset. I could instead divide it into 10 bits, 10 bits, and 12 bits. The top level entry then would have 1,024 2 to the 10th entries. There are a possible 1,024 second level entries, but I only need the second level entries for those pages that are actually used. I don't need two to the 52 of them. A bigger program, more second level entries, right? But I still don't need the full size of the page table. And that means I can use a sparse table for, a, for a, I can get a sparse table out of a multi-level page table entry. It is made up out of that 10 bits of logical bit address, of, of logical address. And then 
The first level page table has 1,024 entries, and we're going to do some arithmetic in that circle plus to find an entry in the second level page table, and that's going to point to frame and offset. So I have I got to have that first 1,024 entry page table, but I do not need all possible second level page tables. I only need enough to accomplish the biggest program that I might be able to run, which is limited by how much physical memory do I have. Okay, so I told you we'd get to real 64-bit computers, and we've gotten there. Real 64-bit computers use a four-level page table. That works just like the two-level two page table, but there's two more, two more steps in there. And it'll make your hair hurt if you, if you work with it too much. But here's the real deal. I don't really have 64-bit addresses. I have 48-bit addresses in these 64-bit computers. Because nobody has two to the 64th bytes of memory. Okay? So I only need to generate a 48-bit address. Now, there, there may come a time when, when we're using all 64 bits, but it is not here yet. Okay, we talked about RISC computers when we talked about modern computer architecture, and I told you they were designed to do register-to-register -register arithmetic, and we put a lot of registers in there, 128 or more registers. I need only one memory reference to fetch the instruction itself, and then... The, the operation is going to be a register-to-register -register operation. But if I'm using virtual memory, I now need two memory references. i got to have a lookup in the page table first before I can fetch the instruction. So now I have two memory references. And memory access is slow. It's not as slow as disk access, but it's much slower than the CPU. So that, that extra memory reference is bad. Okay, here comes this thing called, that should say, translation look aside buffer. Translation look aside buffer, TLB, is nothing more than cache memory for the page table. Instead of having the page table be in real main memory, I'm going to put at least some of it in cache memory, which is accessible quickly, okay? So between 16 and 64 entries that are copies of the recently used page table entries. We've got some more locality of reference going on here. And associative memory so that I can search all of the entries in that cache in one operation. That is the translation look aside buffer, no matter what the slide says. And I'll fix it. Uh, before I put it out there for you. Light cache in virtual memory, the TLB translation look aside buffer works because of locality of reference. Okay, so there's some trade-offs. That page file takes up disk space. Disks, disks have become cheap. Uh, paging takes up resources of the CPU. Paging takes time, but Programs can easily share memory space. More programs can run at the same time because I only need the working set of the program in memory. The working set, remember, is enough page frames to run without thrashing. Programs that can't even fit into memory all at once can run. And I get process separation. Every process has the whole address space. There's no way to generate an address that is in somebody else's address space because the address has to go through that page table. If every program has that full logical address space available, and it does, any address is valid, and it's no longer possible to even think about writing or reading someone else's memory. However, sometimes a program needs access to memory owned by the OS, and the solution 
is to allow memory and operating system to share some part of that virtual address space. Those of you who ever looked at the internals of Windows XP, you could only get two gigabytes of program because the other two were shared by the operating system. And that's why. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about in closing is this thing called segmentation, which is another memory management technique. And what segmentation does is give the programmer more than one address space. And we, we have to add something to the hardware. We're going to add some segment registers to do that. So if I've got only one address space, why well, one dimensional address space, look up there at the top, the call stack is growing upward. Really, we're going to make it grow downward for practical reasons. The call stack could hit the top of the virtual address space. The symbol table doesn't have any room to grow because the source text is right above it. And so tables bump into one another and a program can't run. With segmentation, I put the symbol table in segment zero, the source text in segment one, constants in two, parse tree in three, call stack in four. And each one of those now has the full virtual address space. But now the programmer has to keep track of which segment is being used. If the, does the programmer need to be aware of paging? No. Segmentation? Yes. How many address spaces? Paging one. Segmentation? As many as there are um, segment registers. Can the virtual address space exceed the physical memory size? Yes, in both cases. Can variable size tables be handled easily? No, with paging alone. Yes, with segmentation. Why invented paging? or virtual memory to simulate large memory, segmentation to provide for multiple address spaces. I think this is the last slide. Nope. Virtual memory versus caching. What's the difference? Caching speeds up memory. Virtual memory increases the amount of perceived storage. And that means we get at least some independence from the configuration of the memory. I can run programs bigger than the physical memory as long as I don't need all of that memory at one instant. And I get a smaller cost per bit compared to providing the real main memory of whatever size. And so we finished in time and we have a few minutes for questions. Nobody ever asks me any questions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All right, have a good afternoon. Don't get blown away by the windstorm, and I'll see you on Thursday.